everyone. Uh, welcome to the Alamo Breast Cancer Foundation Hot Topics Mentor Sessions. Uh, we are going to have a panel discussion here tonight uh, with Dr. Alistair Thompson, Dr. Bora Lim, and Dr. Matthew Ellis. Uh, my name is Jonathan Colmere. I'm the Executive Director for the Alamo Breast Cancer Foundation. I just want to thank everyone for joining us here tonight. Um, uh, definitely help yourself to as much food as you'd like and um, look forward to having a really interesting program and, uh, tonight and a Q&A discussion afterwards. So. Um, First, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Alistair Thompson. Uh, Dr. Thompson, over the last 35 years, uh, has trained and practiced as a clinician scientist focused on multidisciplinary patient care alongside translational bench-to-bedside studies and innovative clinical trials in cancer. Uh, Dr. Thompson also led a successful breast cancer laboratory program, provided leadership for a cancer center in the United Kingdom, chaired the UK National Breast Cancer Trials portfolio of 120 studies and engaged in a range of pivotal roles in key drug radiation therapy and surgical trials involving the UK, Europe, the US, and Australia. Since moving to the US in 2014, he has specialized in improving treatment for breast cancer patients, innovative localization techniques for breast conservation and axillary node surgery, and to minimize patient impact through uh, to skin sparing and nipple sparing mastectomy with autologous reconstruction where required. Unusual for a surgeon, Professor Thompson has preclinical and practical experience in the design, implementation, monitoring, and reporting of early through late phase, or, uh, through to late phase drug and medical device trials. Recent pharmaceutical experience includes active leadership of international trials such as the SOL, MA32, uh, MINDACT, and Christine trials. He currently chairs several phase two and phase three data monitoring committees and trials steering groups. For radiotherapy, he co-authored the ASTRO ABPI consensus guidelines and has contributed to intraoperative and hypofractionation trials. Uh, since transitioning to the U.S. national leadership roles, including co-chairing the comparison of operative to monitoring and endocrine therapy comet trials for low-risk DCIS, co-chairing the NCI-BCSC proposed no-surgery clinical trial planning committee, and membership of the NCI Bold Task Force and leadership positions with TBCRC Loco Regional Subgroup Co-Chair, and SWOG Translational Medical Medicine Breast Group Chair, Professor Thompson is an active member of ASCO, SSO, ASBRS, and AACR. With successful peer-reviewed funding from U.S. Uh, government and international charitable sources, linking laboratory to clinical studies, successful supervision of 24 postgraduate students, and some 350 peer-reviewed publications in the highest impact factor clinical and scientific journals. Uh, improved care of those with cancer is his mission. Uh, Dr. Thompson? Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. If you'd like to go ahead first and then walk. We'll That's a real mouthful, John. It is. <laughs> yes. Thank you for. And as your one mother would be proud. Yes. <laughs> and as one of one or two of you in the group here recognize, the most important thing he left out, and that's I married a girl from Mississippi in 2011, moved to the United States, and I've been happy ever since. So that's important. <laughs> nice. <laughs> because she's from Mississippi, or because. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So there, there are three topics which I wanted to briefly touch on that we've been learning a little bit more about today. Uh, a little bit on DCIS from one of the poster sessions. Uh, there's been some really quite nice talks on what surgeons do in the armpit, which probably isn't of interest to most medical oncologists, but is a pressing interest to patients who have to go through surgery. And then thirdly, there were two Oxford overview presentations this morning, which, which I thought were stunningly presented from afar, but actually summarized the input of thousands of women around the world into trying to advance how we prevent breast cancer coming back. So Jonathan, if I have five minutes in oh, total to cover those three means, topics, yeah. I'm gonna try and be brief because I think you're here to ask us questions rather than me listen to my own voice. So let's start with DCIS. Some nice posters this morning, really saying that we're beginning to unpick why does DCIS occur, ductal carcinoma in situ, and why in a proportion of patients does it just stay, be of no consequence at all if it's left alone? And yet in others, it can transform into invasive and sometimes metastatic 
breast cancer. And, and the bottom line for some of the studies, which were largely from the United States, of course, from the Netherlands and from the United Kingdom, seem to be that we're lumping everybody with DCIS into one group of patients. And as Matthew no doubt will, will mention, and he constantly in our frequent interactions reminds me, when we lump things together, we lose a lot of the detail. And what we need to do moving forwards, and it's beginning to happen across the Western Hemisphere at least, is, is to unpick what sort of pre-invasive condition is going on so that we can learn, is this something that we can actually not worry about too much? Or is it something that we need to be much more proactive about? So if you get the chance to, to touch base with those uh, posters in, in abstract form at least, and they will be published in due course, I think the messages there are that DCIS is a bigger problem for some women than it should be. And we're learning more as we go. And I hope one day with the aid of diagnostic strategies, we'll be able to define who needs further treatment and who does not. So the second topic I wanted to touch on were that a series of lectures, I guess, would be the best term, rather than brand new information, which a number of colleagues, um, Stephanie Wong from Canada, uh, Terry Mamounis from, from uh, Miami, and then some radiotherapy colleagues, Reshma Jaxi particularly, were just reminding us how far have we come. Now, many of you are familiar with surgery for a century used to be mastectomy and taking all the lymph glands out of the armpit. And the consequences of that for the surgeon were not so great. But for the individual women, that loss of tissue, that loss of sensation, the lymphedema, uh, and all the complications of surgery were huge and remained huge for the rest of their lives. And what we were reminded over the years is that we've gone to doing less and less armpit surgery so that now sentinel or sentry lymph node biopsy is the standard of care in many situations. And although that's not a trivial operation to go through, it is much less of an insult to the patient than the bigger surgery. And yet, it doesn't result in any disadvantage for that woman. And so, as the radiotherapy uh, professional, Reshma Jagsi, chipped in from Michigan, that combination of working out, does somebody need a little bit of extra treatment in the axilla? If there have been lymph glands which tumor has escaped to and been lodged in, and myself as a surgeon has removed one or two, I don't need to go back and remove all the other, often perfectly fine lymph glands. We can rely on modern, high quality radiotherapy to reduce the chances, sometimes to less chance than surgery alone, of having anything further going on in the armpit or in the chest wall. So the bottom line for those eloquent presentations from my point of view was that less surgery is actually doing just as well, sometimes when combined with modest radiotherapy, in terms of stopping disease progressing or coming back in the future. And yet by doing less, we're actually giving the patients more benefit of better quality of life and less chance of having those dreadful complications like lymphedema. So the third thing I wanted to, to touch on were two, as I said, very beautiful presentations from the Oxford Overview Group. Now, as some of you know, lots of trials happen around the world, and they sometimes come up with slightly different results, sometimes radically different results. And so what a group in Oxford some 20-something years ago decided to do and have got buy-in from around the world is to try and pool information, to pool evidence from clinical trials so that we don't rely on one trial showing one thing and a second trial showing something different. We try and put the information together by using the individual patient's information and try and learn in the broader scheme of things internationally what do these trials mean. And so, to cut a long story short, they were focusing on the issue of tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors, what might be better for premenopausal women, and then in a second set of studies, does everyone need all the chemotherapies we tend to give? In the first set of those studies, the, the so-called soft and text 
trials, it was very, I, I guess, very reassuring to know that other trials, for example, those conducted in Austria and uh, further afield, when combined with those two trials we've all been looking at, came up with a similar set of results that for premenopausal women at risk, at particular risk of developing uh, distant metastasis or recurrence, then suppressing the ovaries and giving an aromatase inhibitor is probably a better bet than tamoxifen. But as one of the questioners posed through the chairman, they look at the results, but in part of that overview group, they can't look at the side effects. And as many of you know better than me, and I know from friends, family, some of the menopausal side effects that we inflict on people by giving some of these medications are not pleasant at all. So the bottom line, I think, for all of us is we've got to balance the potential for 2 or 3% benefit in terms of preventing disease coming back versus the potential side effects. And then finally, there was another big overview, Oxford overview, presented, which looked at some of the different chemotherapies we use. And as you know, the red devil, as I like to still call it, of, of anthracycline, is very effective, but it does have potential to cause problems to the heart and, and to, to potentially cause leukemias in the future. And their question was, do you need anthracyclines, the red devil, along with the taxanes? And if I understood things correctly, it sounds as so that the scheduling, or the scheduling as I would say, of those um, drugs is really important. And that in people at higher risk, a dose-dense sort of chemotherapy may well be the way forwards in the future. And I think that's what many colleagues continue to use in this country. So I'm going to stop there. And I think through you, Jonathan, either take a question or two or hand over to my more eloquent colleagues. Dr. Matthew Ellis serves as director of the Lester and Sue Smith Breast Center at Baylor. Uh, he is a world-renowned clinician and researcher of the molecular profiling of breast cancer. Ellis is a native of the United Kingdom. He completed his medical degree from Queen's College and School of Clinical Medicine at the University of Cambridge in England. Uh, postgraduate clinical training at the Royal College of Physicians in London and PhD training at the Royal Postgraduate Medical School at the University of London. Prior to coming to Baylor, Ellis was at Washington University School of Medicine, where he served as professor of medicine, head of breast oncology, and head of medical oncology. Prior to Washington University, Ellis served on the faculty at Duke University and Georgetown University. His research has unveiled groundbreaking new information about mutations in breast cancer and their clinical relevance. He has been instrumental in developing a genome atlas and therapeutic roadmap for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Most recently, he has found that metastatic breast cancer tumors, initially positive for the estrogen receptor, frequently harbor mutations and translocations in the receptor that render the tumor resistant to endocrine therapies used to block estrogen. Uh, Dr. Ellis is a funded scholar of the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas and the Susan G. Komen Foundation for the Cure. Dr. Ellis, thank you for being with us tonight. That's very kind. So um, I just thought I'd talk a little bit about breast cancer diagnostics. I don't, I don't mean, you know, the diagnosis through a mammogram or something, but what you do uh, with the material that you take from the breast and the pathologist says, you've got invasive breast cancer. See, from my perspective, invasive breast cancer is not a diagnosis. It's a syndrome, you know, like pneumonia. There's 200 different kinds of pneumonia. Well, there's hundreds of different kinds of breast cancer as well, which sounds pretty alarming. In some senses, it is. But in the other sense, you know, if, if you can dig into that complexity, you might actually get to some of the answers that we need. Like, for example, who needs chemotherapy or what kind of chemotherapy or what kind of targeted therapy or which type of endocrine therapy. I suppose, you know, as a starting point, um, breast cancer is a disease of the human genome. So the human genome is 3 billion base pairs long. COVID-19 is 30,000 base pairs long. So obviously, we're dealing with a problem that's 100,000 more times more complicated. 
Um, but there's only so many ways a, a, a tumor can pervert its genome to become a cancer. And uh, by a series of sort of very careful studies where the mantra, the most important research for breast cancer research are patients, their samples and their outcomes, emphasis on the outcomes, because obviously you're trying to track down the you're sort of molecular sleuthing the answers as to why patients, for example, will respond to drug X or drug Y. You're, we're beginning to coalesce around a new diagnostic sort of definition of breast cancer, which is beginning to transform the way we even label breast cancers. So let, let me try and give you a bit of a history on this. Uh, and then it will bring us to a couple of observations for, from uh, presentations um, uh, at this meeting. So I was hanging around with a guy called Chuck Peru at the University of North Carolina in the 2000s. And he'd just done a very interesting experiment where he did uh, sort of genome-wide RNA profiling. So trying to measure this interesting entity called mRNA, which is a sort of connection between the DNA and the, the, the proteins that actually execute the tumor's behavior. And he measured all these RNAs, and he stuck them in a big computer and asked the question, do all these RNAs from all these genes from all over the genome create patterns that allow us to sort of relabel breast cancers in such a way that you would actually you know, be able to do a better job at predicting what happens? And that's what he found, and he called them the intrinsic subtypes of breast cancer. They were called intrinsic for several reasons. One was if, if you took a post-treatment sample and a pre-treatment sample, actually, they, 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 the, many of these genes were not perturbed by, by treatment. They were intrinsic to the structure of that particular cancer. And he sat down uh, with his colleagues. Uh, he was at Stanford at the time. Pretty soon, uh, he, he moved to UNC, where he's been for, what, 20 years, something like that. I'm saying hello to Patty Spears here because she knows his story. Um, and basically, he gave, them, he gave them labels. One label is luminal. So luminal is your estrogen receptor positive breast cancers. Although, well, there's all sorts of details here. I won't get off track. So, but basically, there's this luminal type of breast cancer, which sort of broke off into two or three groups. But largely, we talk about two groups. Luminal A, which are very slow-growing estrogen-fed breast cancers, and luminal B, which are faster-growing, yet still partially estrogen-fed breast cancers. And I'll get to that in a minute. And then there's two other types. There's one called basal-like. So basal-like are the majority diagnosis for triple-negative breast cancer. But if you look at triple-negative breast cancers, they're not all basal-like. And then there's another group so you're thinking of four diseases, which were called HER2 enriched, not HER2 positive, HER2 enriched. It was called HER2 enriched because not every one of those HER2 enriched breast cancers were HER2 positive. So in fact, it's kind of like five different diseases because the HER2 enriched population are divided into those that are HER2 positive and those that are HER2 negative. Okay. So that was all fine and dandy, and that was, you know, a nice paper in a fancy journal, but then we got a grant from the National Cancer Institute to actually turn that into a clinical test. And the clinical test is something called the PAM-50. And the PAM-50 gives you a subtype diagnosis. And the nice thing about the PAM-50, we made the uh, informatics generic. So it didn't matter how you measured the RNA, and there's lots of different RNA techniques, Lots of people could look at that model in a variety of different trials, you know, in neoadjuvant trials, in metastatic trials, in, you know, in, 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 uh, in, in early disease, where patients have got different kinds of endocrine therapy to try and sort out what's the clinical utility. And the bottom line, we got to a place in 2021, we now have to take this re-diagnosis of breast cancer extremely seriously because it's becoming increasingly obvious that patients are not getting the right treatment. So let me give you an example. In a study that we're going to be presenting tomorrow, patients getting preoperative endocrine therapy, right? What you're trying to do is shrink down a strongly hormone receptor positive breast cancer 
so Dr. Thompson can do a better surgery because the tumor's always better to operate on a smaller cancer than a larger cancer. A lot of patients who are postmenopausal with estrogen receptor-rich breast cancer, you don't really want to give them grandma chemotherapy, but you can shrink it down with an aromatase inhibitor, right? And we've been doing this kind of research for years. We took those, that particular trial that compared diff three different treatments, doesn't matter what the treatments were for now, and from about 800 of them, so a really large number, we did this thing called RNA-seq. So we're doing all the RNA measurements, and then we applied the PAM50 model to that RNA-seq using that generic algorithm that's available to everyone to use. And the shocking thing was, first of all, 7% of those supposedly estrogen receptor-rich breast cancers were non-luminal. They're not estrogen receptor driven at all. Now 7% doesn't sound like a big number until you realize it's 7% of potentially 150,000 women in the United States a year. That is a huge number because those HER2 enriched or basal like breast cancers that are mislabeled ER positive should be getting treatment that's for triple negative breast cancer. And if you look at the endocrine therapy responsiveness of those non-luminal tumors, they don't respond to endocrine drugs at all. So then, also, those patients are going to get five or ten years of endocrine drugs that are not going to do anything for them at all. And then we, in fact, we, there, there were more studies showing this misdiagnosis problem in the metastatic setting. This is looking at uh, studies with CDK4-6 inhibitors, where they they're all supposed to be estrogen receptor positive, but there was a very interesting uh, finding. One, there was a, like we saw in that uh, uh, alternate trial, there's a small number of estrogen receptor positive breast cancers that are called basal-like. And in those CDK4-6 inhibitor trials, no response to CDK4-6 inhibitor at all. So those patients, again, are getting the wrong therapy. They should be getting pembrolizumab and chemotherapy. They shouldn't be getting um, uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors. And then there was an interesting route that the HER2 enriched, non-2 amplified, were getting a massive benefit from the CDK4-6 inhibitor. Why? Because we've just shown that the HER2 enriched tumors don't respond to endocrine therapy. So effectively, the control arm who are getting endocrine therapy in the HER2-enriched patients are getting no treatment at all. So, of course, giving them something has a massive benefit. So what, and, and, and in all the discussion chats we're doing, they said, well, it's all very well, but we're not using the intrinsic subtyping to, to, to treat patients every day. But I think now we have to get serious about it because patients are going into the wrong boxes. We've got perfectly good treatment. We're just not giving them accurately. The final thing I'll say is that there's been several um, discussions of the value of not this RNA profiling thing I've been talking about, but analysis of mutations. So I started off the talk saying, you know, the, the, the human genome is three billion base pairs long. If you sequence lots of breast cancers, you get lots of different mutations. Some of them are recurrent, some of them are not. And we're beginning to pick through all those recurrent mutations one by one by one to find a targeted therapy. For example, Bora and I do this all the time. We have trials uh, with the National Cancer Institute digging into these subsets of tumors that had these mutations that had previously unappreciated significance for, for therapeutic vulnerability. Uh, we discovered things like HER2 mutation, where the HER2 gene is not amplified, it's mutant. And, to, and this uh, uh, San Antonio, we have a poster on a drug that was like an orphan HER2 kinase inhibitor that no one's using, has wildly active for one of the commonest mutations that was resistant to another drug. Just happens that we were able to work that out in the lab. So this, this meticulous sort of bashing away at the, at, the, at, the, at the sort of genomic medicine, the precision medicine, is bringing advances. And, the, and, and I think you're going to talk about the uh, uh, new CERD and the ESR1 mutation stuff, which is another really interesting story about how we're making progress. So in summary, breast cancer is a fiendish, fiendishly complicated disease. But it's fiendishly complicated because the human genome is a fiendishly complicated disease. But we have all these 21st century tools 
that we can begin to prove outcomes one patient at a time. But two things. Everything depends on the cooperation from our beautiful patients because nothing's more precious than the patients, their outcomes, and their samples, because we've got to work on those samples to, make, to move the agenda forward. So advocacy is absolutely essential in, in, in this whole um, effort. Um, and then the other thing is we have to force the agenda of precision medicine, because it's very easy just to be relaxed back into the brown stain on a slide and ER staining with the pathologist and HER2 staining and all these arguments about is the, how brown is that brown stain to say someone's HER2 positive. It's 2021, I've been doing this for 30 years and watching all these diagnostic errors happen in my own clinic we have to get to a better place. So we have to work with the medical device companies. We have to work with the profiling companies. We have to work with academics who are working on all these disease subsets and not be afraid to attack this problem with our 21st century approaches. We have them. We can do artificial intelligence. We can do decision machine learning. We can use all sorts of technologies to, 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 to get us to a more accurate place where we actually understand what's wrong with each individual patient. Because if you don't know what's wrong with someone, you're not going to give them the right treatment. But we're pretty close to begin to a state where we know what's wrong with you. Even though this is a complicated disease, we can pinpoint the drivers and drug them effectively. So I'll stop there, because that's quite enough of me. And it's Bora's time. <laughs> OK, Dr. Bora Lim. I uh, just want to introduce her here. Let me open up my. Screen here, okay, uh, so despite rapidly evolving therapeutic advancement in modern <clears throat> oncology, still more than 40,000 women and men succumb to metastatic breast cancer uh, each, I'm sorry, each year, um, uh, cause death each year. To relieve the suffering of patients, I have focused, uh, Dr. Lim is focused on achieving the three goals below. For the last 10 years as a translational researcher, uh, first to formulate novel therapeutic strategies to induce effective eradication of aggressive breast cancers, such as triple negative breast cancers, inflammatory breast cancers, subset of endocrine therapy resistant luminal breast cancers. Second goal is to develop accompanying robust selective biomarkers that will enrich the patient who will benefit from this innovative biomarker-driven clinical trials, integrating novel assays uh, such as liquid biopsy multiomic uh, analysis. The third goal is to create the biological map of breast cancer evolution by large collaborative efforts with cutting-edge labs that develop uh, novel assays such as single cell genomics, spatial genomics, and proteogenomics. As the Director of Translational Research of Breast Oncology and the Associate Director of Clinical Science of Lester and Sue Smith Breast Center, Dr. Lim plans to expand this goal by heavily engaging wealthy basic translational research at Baylor's community and developing early, early phase therapeutics programs. Dr. Lim has received three teaching awards, Lou Dynon by Penn Medical Students in 2011, Multidisciplinary Teaching Awards by Breast Surgical Fellows at MD Anderson in 2017 and 2020, Young Investigator Award from SWOG, SWOG ITCG Hope Foundation, Vail Aspen AACR ASCO Workshops, AAMC Women Faculty Early Career Leadership, CTEP, CDA, and more. Dr. Lim, thank you for joining us this evening. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. I didn't think that it was going to be all red, so, you know, like I usually sum it the same line, so thank you for the kind introduction. So I just be honored to be here with these two giants in breast cancer, you know, who has de devoted their life to improve the lives of women. But I think sometimes, you know, when you see like this the large crew of uh, these amazing researchers that and then one of one time that you see this young individual like in the middle, you're like, OK, what is that person doing there? But I think it's very important to have the next generation so we can carry on the legacy. So I think that's kind of like my role here, that no matter how wonderful things are being built, that if you have next person who can actually carry on and continue, then that's it stops there. And I think that's what I'm learning more and more as I do more of this job. And as I'm doing such a job, I recognize many of the patient advocacy that I met over the years, that over the time that I came here in San Antonio. And I have to say, I'm learning so much about individual. Um, this, so precision medicine to me, I'm gonna so talk a little bit about precision medicine that I'm learning through San Antonio and have a maybe two small examples that I learned for the last two days of presentation in San Antonio. 
and I'll see if I can make sense out of it. Um, so to me, the precision oncology is twofold. One is the precision oncology of understanding the cancer. So there's really no doubt that if you meet hundreds of your friends who are diagnosed with breast cancer, everybody will tell you a completely different story, right? Like somebody will say, oh, you know, all I had to do is just doing the surgery and they told me I don't even need the radiation, I just took the pill for five years and I'm good, to somebody who had gone through six months of chemotherapy and then have to get the mastectomy and had to get the radiation and had to get it like more therapy afterwards to somebody who thought that they just completed the finish line and then within three months they were told that your cancer is back you're you know back to square zero you're starting all over again so i think that's precision oncology to me is that understanding the deep biology and how this deep biology and the intrinsic subtype and also their um, communicating with the host and different system to evolve into the next step of disease. So natural course of the breast cancer using all of this new technology, understanding precision oncology is one thing. But as a treating physician, like all of us are, I think the other important factor is the personal preference and then what individual you're you know, encountering today. So like when we had the oral cert presentation that everybody was really like ramped up about, there was a lot of Twitter chat. So, you know, one of the things that I usually do, I used to be one of those young, am ambitious person who come and like snaps in that picture and said, oh, overall response rate, 58%, you know, hazard ratio 0 0.8, like it's gonna change the clinic tomorrow. But I, now I know enough, you know, so to, instead of doing that, you know, engaging the community and said, how does the patients actually feel about this, you know, difference in the PFS? What are the you know, learning that we're doing as a community? And then there's always learning that you can get. And so one of the very basic points that I learned as I'm gonna talk briefly about the oral cert is, you know, we had a like, few chats kind of among the patient advocacy friends and they're saying, oh, so are you gonna change the cert to oral cert tomorrow if it's approved? And somebody said, oh, I would rather take the zap every month rather than having the nausea every single day. So I think that, so, and I do have patients like that, you know, so even for this wonderful new antibody drug conjugate, some of my ladies will say, you know what, Dr. Lim, this is awesome. I just come in every three weeks, I get the treatment, I feel great. I have a little bit of loss in the hair here, but who cares, I'm already married, you know, like have three kids. They're all fine, they're grown up, they have the scholarship, I'm good. Or then I have a patient who's like, oh my God, I have this horrible nausea every single day. I don't want to get this drug. You know, so I think that individual understanding of your patient, and if I know that, then next time if I'm going to select the drug for that patient, I want to make sure that I find the drug that's not going to cause the nausea. So I think it's kind of twofold. And in some way, while we're painting all this beautiful picture of wonderful machine learning, new drugs, we're spending like a lot of money to find that the next best oral cert, while we're doing that, I think to me, San Antonio always ground me down and say, what you're trying to do is save your patients today. You know, it's not, you're not talking about some random specimen or anything like that. You are dealing with your patients for your friends, your teachers, and all of that. So I think to me, San Antonio always grounds me. So from that perspective, uh, when I looked at the two interesting study in that the later line setting was presented recently, is that one of them is oral cert. And to me, it was very, very exciting because every time I have a patient who you know, some of my patients are like Pilates teacher, you know, they have like a lot of muscle and they're like, oh, Dr. Lim, just give it to me. Give me the zap. I'm going to do it. And then they, the next day they come back with a huge bruise. I'm like, oh my God, what the hell just did you give me? I didn't realize I have to get another shot in both buttocks in two weeks. And so some patients hate those needles. And for those patients, I say, just hang in there, you know, oral surgery is coming. There's like multiple good ones coming. Just wait. And so this was the first one came out and everybody was like, whoa, oral surgery. But then because of the trial design and um, how it was supposed to answer the question that they wanted to address, it may not seem so impressive on paper right away. Because you know, a lot of times we are so used to see this large phase three trials that is published beautifully at the same time that the, the, the investigators on the podium use it in New England Journal of Medicine paper. And it's very beautifully designed to impress you. So you're so used to see those type of data and then you see this very brand new baby just came out of the womb and say, oh my God, like, how do I interpret this data? So I think, but at the same time, I had a chance to briefly chat with Matthew before he came to the session. I also was you know, busy dealing with all these 300 sessions that he's chairing. So I didn't have time to chat with him, but 
like having the session, <laughs> having that initial baby came out of the womb, I think is opening up a lot of doors. So now we can truly address. The other thing in that study that I have noticed is like in that ESR mutations, of course, there's a lot of deep dive we need to do. For example, I am sure like Matthew and Alistair is going to be one of them that I'm going to be also chipped in into the team, trying to understand what type of ESR mutation, is the mutation enough, is there has to be other you know, co-mutation, fusions, and so on and so forth. So while we are doing this deep dive, one thing I noticed is that two years ago, if somebody came up and say, there's a circulating tumor DNA-based ESR mutation, you can actually track and see who might be the one who's benefiting. Two years ago, everybody was like, oh, okay, well, so are we really doing the ctDNA? But I was so surprised that nobody even brought up the point of circulating tumor DNA. So we are already so familiar looking at the circulating tumor DNA. And finally, those type of assays that nobody, everybody didn't really believe in or everybody had a hard time to kind of trying to find the translatability is actually already here. So to me, that was kind of like two major lessons. And of course, to me, this oral surgery is very exciting as a translation researcher when you're trying to combine your new drug into the third, which is one of the very potent endocrine therapy. If you're having oral drug, it's always very easier to combine you know, than some of the other, um, you know, you, you have a medication you're taking every single day, but you also have to come in for every four weeks to get the, you know, your buttocks jab, not just left, not just right, like, so we have to do the dance in the clinic. So it's, and then they're like, okay, so is this nurse here today? I want her to only give me the injection, you know? So if you don't have to do that, I think there's always beneficial. It's opened a huge door for us, both research and the treatment. And I think there might be like way more number of SIR that we're gonna see. And I'm looking forward to see whether this is going to be another CDK46 inhibitor um, era where initially we thought they're all of the same, now we're starting to learn that they may not be always the same and they might be slightly different. So that's about the oral surgery. I'm sure Matthew will add some more later on. Uh, the other thing is the antibody drug conjugate. I'm sure many of you know that you know, last year, two biggest kind of FDA approved drugs that helped a lot of my patients are both, one in HER2, the other one is in the triple negative breast cancer that is have a special linker, that it has a, the bomb, that has a chemo inside that usually not used for your usual breast cancer treatment, but because it has a different mechanism, it can actually induce the response even after you, you know, progress on Red Devil or Texane. And it's actually having very new target that we didn't think that it may not be that important, like a trope 2. So when these antibody drug conjugate with the great linker, with the same target, the main question that you know, we had as a translation investigator were, if somebody had progressed on one drug, can we actually give the patient another drug? And I think there's a still questionability of that aspect. You know, so that kind of all of this clinical information, patient's experience, and what we are discovering in the lab, and also preclinical studies really teaching us each target might be different, and that new type of target that we are not too familiar with in the previous experiments, Maybe it's really, it's a time for us to take a little bit of deep dive. Maybe this is really not a time that, you know, we are going to do just simple trope to zero, one, two, three percentage and say, oh, you have a three plus, therefore we're gonna give you this drug. It's probably way more complicated then. And once we have a great drug, I think we need to understand what's the best way to actually give that drug. You know, so who's gonna be the person who's gonna benefit? Who might be the person who is even um, progressing in one drug? we can still salvage by the second drug, or even going beyond that, if this target has a, such a meaning, is there a better strategy to actually target that, that specific protein? So I think that is something I'm kind of learning by reviewing some of the data, and then I think I'm stopped there. <laughs> no more jibber jabber and then taking questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Dr. Lim. Um, I'd like to open up the uh, uh, panel here to questions from the floor and from our live viewers on Socio. Uh, if we have any questions coming in, feel free to step up to the mic and uh, our team here will assist you in asking the question. Or if we have any questions coming in online, uh, let's let us know. Hi, I'm Barbara Segarra. I'm a patient advocate and I live in Puerto Rico. Um, the, the thing that I think is the message as clinician is we are here and we, I have been a breast cancer survivor for almost 19 years, so I've been learning all these years. 
But if I had this, you know, if I had to choose something in 2003 when I was diagnosed, I didn't know what to do. And that happens, you know, patients don't even know what cancer is, what breast cancer is, let alone luminal ABC, whatever, and all the, the you know, the, the signatures. And, and I, I know that we have to choose, and, the, you know, they say we're going to present it to the patients, and they, we're going to let them decide. But how are they going to decide with the limited information or sometimes limited time? You're diagnosed, you're just digesting, um, you have cancer. What I'm going to do, am I going to die? And if you have kids or not or whatever. So how can we, you know, I know we as advocates do that, and that's why we come here and we try to help. But, you know, it's very difficult. And when we see the clinical sessions that they give here and we have everybody saying, no, I won't do that. And I say, you know, as clinicians, you can't agree. How can a patient agree? So just recommendation on how you do it and how can we do it better. Dr. Thompson? So if, if I may begin to address your very perceptive question, because the problem you allude to is everybody's problem, I think there are probably three steps to take. The first is to go visit when you have a diagnosis with a multidisciplinary team of people. And we're one example whereby Matthew and Bora were colleagues of mine first, and I actually now think they're friends of mine first, but also colleagues. So on a Tuesday, Bora and I sit this close to each other in the clinic computer rooms and go and see patients in, in rooms next door to each other and, and swap over and, and pop our heads around the door to see people. And I think that multidisciplinary, not just surgeon and medical oncologist, but um, genetics counselors, for example, trying to give the input so that you can make decisions that are good for you as an individual at the end of the day. Second thing is, as, as Matthew's been saying, breast cancer is endlessly complicated. The more I learn, the less I understand is probably the way I would paraphrase it for me. And then thirdly, to try and come up with a, a sort of plan of action where I hope as an individual patient you can influence the decisions and the choices that are relevant to you, but I would hope be well advised by whichever team is, is advising you. So that would be my suggestion. Others? Um, oh, I, I, you know, when you're a medical oncologist, uh, you know, and you go into a room, I found the most important thing is to read the patient in the first two or three minutes. Are they so anxious and unable to sit and listen to what you have to say? Most of your time with the patient is saying reassuring things, getting them off the ceiling, having them sit down, getting them to trust you, and then you're gonna to have to have another session with them when they're not overwhelmed. I'll share, you know, I've been through the cancer experience myself recently, and it's really overwhelming. You know, there's, there's, and there's all this unknown, you know, when you first go in the room and they say, unfortunately, Dr. Ellis, you, you got prostate cancer, all your biopsies are positive, and you're going, you know, your whole life it flashes before you, and you just assume you're going to be dying of metastatic prostate cancer in a year. And then you go through the whole process, and you, they calm you down, and they say, we're going to do this, and it's not so bad, and, you know, and finally, you finally say, okay, I'm ready to do the next step. So, you know, so that's your first job. You've got to read the patient. And then, you know, the, another patient, you, you're the fourth opinion, right? And, and so, but I treat that patient like I'm the fir their first opinion, the first oncologist they've ever met. I don't assume that anyone said anything to them that, that uh, you know, because I'm worried I might lose, miss out on some critical parts of the argument, you know, and so little diagrams, and this is how it's done. And a lot of patients say, you know, the oncologist actually didn't sit down and even explain to me what breast cancer is and how the decisions are made. They just walk in the room and say, okay, you're going to get chemotherapy, start next Tuesday, see you in a bit. I mean, almost the conversation is brief as that. So that's obviously not a very good way of practicing, and that's why there can be a lot of mistrust between... Uh, doctors and patients, and that's why they're the fourth opinion, because they've gone to other people who've not spent any time with them. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe Bora, you, you, you've had similar kinds of experiences. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I think the, the highest number I've gone was probably like six opinion. <laughs> but, you know, I think, so, you know, we're all human beings. I think just like, so even as a physician, you know, we have our favorite surgeon. I wouldn't say who, but, you know, <laughs> we have our favorite radiation oncologist or, you know, so well, if you have a somebody that, let's say, if somebody, you're not so sure if this person is truly progressing on the bone, I have my trusted radiologist. I would pick up the phone and say, hey, can you look at this imaging with me? So we are, have this tendency. So I think patients and physician relationship is also the same. Like, especially because I focus on metastatic breast cancer, literally you're dealing with your daily life, you know, every single day. And so I think that rapport between the patient and physician is just so important. So to me, what I found out is at the beginning, we do this dance, you know, so I try to be like, I'm sure you're very smart and I'm sure you read like Dr. Google for the consultation for the last 20 hours, but I'm going to give you my perspective version of this, what breast cancer is about, where you belong and why I'm saying, why I'm doing this thing, please read this through and, you know, and then, then we hear this patient's concern. But even with that, I know it's going to just go all the way overhead and we're going to have to do the same dance over and over again. But even though I may not have this longevity of the practice that I like these giants have, if your patient trusts you, it doesn't really matter. Like if you, they really trust you, if I say, oh, I am really sorry, but you know, for this trial, you have to get three biopsies, they will do it because they trust you and then they actually can understand why you're doing this. And so I'm not saying that I'm selling it by you using your report, but I think establishing the initial trust is very important. So like, for example, one of the frustrating things that could, could happen is if somebody was labeled as a, you know, HER2 positive and for some reason we run, we run the test and then in our test it's showing the HER2 negative and then you have other side of the doctor who has a very strong opinion about like why the patient has to get So while we are waiting for this resolution of those discrepancy, a lot of patients feel very distraught and lost. And so I think having initial, so one of, part of our job as a medical oncologist is like being a de detective making sure that you didn't miss any information, making sure you have the comprehensive information for that patient. And then, you know, present that with the confidence and you are only at your mercy of patients to trust you. So I, I don't know, that's just my honest opinion, but. So we have a question from our online viewers here. Uh, what has been presented thus far regarding progress to effective treatment for early stage TNBC or recurrent TNBC? So I, I think this is alluding to the pembrolizumab keynote trials, which have been updated at, at this meeting or are being updated in this meeting in the um, early setting, so-called, and in the dealing with advanced or metastatic disease. And I'll hand over to my <laughs> thoughtful, clever <laughs> colleagues who, who do this sort of thing, which, which I don't. Yeah. So I think, Matthew, you actually chaired the session, didn't you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm putting him in a spot. Yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> That was, that was an interesting session. I got, I, got, uh, I got to see all the questions and then sort of had to summarize the questions and, and, and interrogate the uh, presenter a little bit. I think there's, there's little doubt that pembrolizumab is a first-in-class uh, immune checkpoint blockade drug that improves outcomes uh, for patients with early-stage TNBC. Um, the, the curves, for me, were, were quite impressive, particularly in node-positive disease, with about a 9-ish percent improvement in recurrence uh, free survival, that's of the same order of magnitude as trastuzumab, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so clearly, uh, clearly in advance. But the frustrating thing uh, about the data is the predictive biomarkers failed. And it's another one of those brown stains on a slide, you know, uh, pathologist staring down the microscope and counting cells kind of thing, that we have to get away from that. We've got all sorts of wonderful technologies to profile the immune microenvironment, understand the DNA repair defects that generate the immunogenicity. Many, many biomarkers, actually Carlos Caldas later was talking about the importance of, of little proteins on the surface cell that, pre that present the abnormal proteins that the tumor's making. I mean, there's lots and lots of ways to understand this, and we have to get that information into clinic because whilst Prembolivimab, without a doubt, improves things, in most patients, a pretty well-tolerated drug when added to chemotherapy. Fully about 40% of patients go through all that chemotherapy only to be told after six months of a very miserable time that it hasn't worked. 
So what's going on in the ones where it doesn't work? Why are those tumors not responding? Why does the chemotherapy not work? And can we identify those patients right on day one to do something else? And that's, that's a particular passion of mine right now. So, so, the, the, so I think we can be pretty sure that uh, pembrolizumab will be a, in daily use in, in, for TNBC, but I think it's only the beginning of the story, and there's many other drugs that are, that, that are being presented in combinations of immune therapies and maybe even cellular therapies one day in the future yeah. for TNBC. Uh, does that cover it, Laura? Yeah, and then I think we are at the first time in ever in the TNBC where we can talk about the diagrams and algorithm in the adjuvant therapy. We didn't have that few years back. Like when I have TMBC patients, oh, well, you have a, a lot of residual disease, but we have no option for you. We'll see you every three months. I'll see you next visit. But now we are at the point that if you're a BRCA mutated, then you can have a Olaparib as yep. an option. Pembrolizumab, there's a lot of argument back and forth. If you have a PCR, are you going to continue, not continue? So I think there's a lot more in the pipeline. And that brings up more conversations in that early stage setting. So instead of having like one giant study published, I think there's a lot of movements and having the upstaging, downstaging of the personalized approach that is being built get, in the early TNBC. Get the, get the questions brief. Sure. Yep. brief. Sure. Yeah. There's lots of great questions I can see. Yeah. 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 I think we need to let, let's, one let, per, let's one get per through per these <laughs> and uh, maybe think, keep our answers yeah. brief. Yeah. There's actually a gentleman. Yeah. No, there's what, yeah, a, there's, a, a, there's a, a live question of which always take precedence. Thank you for coming. Right. Hi, I'm Bob Ritter from Ithaca, New York, a 25 year survivor of breast cancer. Um, I, I love the movement towards precision oncology, but I don't have a Baylor or MD Anderson nearby. You know, in upstate New York, you know, I have a community hospital. Right. My oncologist serves all kinds of cancer patients. How can the community hospital setting keep up with this new age? Very good question. What a fabulous yeah. question. Yeah, wonderful question. So, I mean, I think, I think that does underscore uh, a vast sea of disparity in equity uh, and, and, uh, and lack of equality in healthcare systems all over the world. This isn't a... This isn't uh, just a, an American thing. So, so I, think, uh, I think there's an increasing emphasis in comprehensive cancer centers to do community outreach, to do exactly what you're talking about, solve that problem. Because every patient deserves to get the best possible treatment and take advantage of all the advances that are, that are, that, 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 that are coming forth. And I think one of, the, one of the things that we're going to see a big growth in is telemedicine. So for example, you know, you, you, you say to your community doc or your community doctor says to you, I'm not quite sure what to do. Let's do a telemedicine consult with a clever doctor called Dr. Lim at Baylor College of Medicine. And so I think we're gonna see a lot more of, of, of that kind of virtual consultations. So patients who can't travel can take advantage of the expertise, if that makes any sense. Hmm. I think there's one other thing very briefly, I've personally found very useful and that's things like the ASCO Post, which is a digest of what has been presented at all the big conferences, and, and other similar sort of pushes through uh, email to just educate people like me about what's going on that, in areas that I don't know anything about. And that takes five minutes of time looking at an email, but it spares five days of time going to a, a conference somewhere in some way. So that educating ourselves as clinicians using some of the tools that have become available, I think is something that is becoming better known and, and letting your colleagues or letting your uh, people locally know that simple surgeons in, in Houston find that very helpful. Sometimes it's useful. So I have a one very tiny vision on that. Very tiny so vision on that. My vision so in 10 years my is that instead in of having years? us expanding ourselves into the telemedicine, I want to create, using the, using the AI and machine learning, I want to create Dr. Ellis and Dr. Thompson that can be generalized, usable. I think we could get there. So like, you know, if we have a very good algorithm to make a decision making, not that old is very sophisticated, but it's very basic to medium to whatever level, I think we can actually get there to have that, that score generations to that. If you press the button, you say, okay, this might be your best algorithm. I, I, I think that's my small vision. We've just been retired. <laughs> that guy, <she's> like, <laughs> yeah, so you may not be invited the, anymore. The well, the AI to replace you. Wants, uh, I'm, I'm all for it. I've got, I've got sailing to do. Okay. We um, have another question from the audience here. Uh, 
Yes, thank you. Uh, Bob kind of stole my thunder, but <laughs> I wanted to say that um, at many of these meetings, and I've been coming for years and years, I'm not going to tell you how many, but there was always an advocate that asked the question that needed to be asked, and we lost her this year. S Sandy's Spivey. So um, I'm Sandy, and I'm going to be a very poor uh, replacement for her. But you touched on something in one of the meetings that I thought was extraordinary, and that is COVID has taught us some good lessons. Mm -hmm. My concern is the, the hospital systems and the, the institutional systems are built and are structured for their convenience and their schedule, yeah. not for the patient's schedule. Agreed. And I think the one thing that's come out of COVID is that we can do this better. You know, we can do telemedicine. We don't, the, the patient doesn't have to come to a Baylor or an MD Anderson. We can go to them. Uh, they don't have to come and get their medications if they're participating in a clinical trial. We can send it to them. But those are incredible strides. My concern is, are we going to go back to the old ways? What can we do? How can we be sure that things are going to be what we call more patient-centered? Uh, that's a, such a great question. And uh, so on the other side of the street, uh, us physicians uh, are represented by uh, ASCO. And uh, I just went to do a session uh, on this between 12 and 2, and one of the questions is, you know, you know what's COVID, uh, how's COVID affecting translational medicine and clinical research? And Cliff Huddis made the very, he's the president, who's the CEO of ASCO, made the very point you're making, we should not go back. We, should, we need to make clinical trials easier. We need to be consenting patients using, you know, using Zoom. You know, we, we need to be shipping drugs to patients. We need to make it as easy as possible for them to participate. They can go to their local hospital and get their CT scans, and those CT scans are perfectly viable uh, for the purpose of the clinical trial endpoints. They don't have to travel 300 miles from, I know, Lubbock, Texas, to come to the Texas Medical Center to get a CT scan when they can be getting it done locally. We need to design trials that are patient-friendly and patient convenient. Uh, so I think you touched on a wonderful point, and I think COVID has taught us lots and lots of lessons on how, how to adapt and do things better than the old way where we were sort of stuck. Almost like using clinical trials as a way to lure patients into big medical centers, which is absolutely not, way, not, not the way to do it. So thanks for that brilliant question. And, and I'm going to hold you to it. <laughs> Please do. So one of the practical things that, that we've been doing is sometimes having a first patient consultation by video link. It's amazing that a, a mobile phone, cell phone now can act just as well as a person-to-person -person conversation. That may not resolve the issues of doing physical examination, for example, but at least you can find out, is this person needing to see a, a surgeon or, or actually is it somebody else she may or he may need to see? So I think we've got to make sure that the video consultations are absolutely kept going. Thank you. So I see the a question, question here. From, on, uh, we yeah. take the question Sorry. from our audience member here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Laura Carfang. I'm a patient advocate based out of Boston. I have a couple questions. Um, the first, Dr. Thompson, you were mentioning about lymphedema and the red devil, and my ears perked up. And then, you know, we're hearing, um, I'll just phrase my question in my own personal experience. I've been on all of those. I have lymphedema. I've been on many, many drugs. And I'm curious if in the research, and we're cutting down on surgery, and there's so much positive, what are we doing for patients who then are still suffering in terms of the quality of life? And are there still going to be trials and opportunities to reduce toxicity and cardiac disease and all of the subsequent longer term with patients living longer? Yeah. My second question is for Dr. Ellis. You mentioned 7% um, of the study, 7% of the people came back and potentially are on incorrect treatments. Um, I also feel like I fall into that category. I almost fell off the table when my doctor said I was going to be on oral um, aromatase inhibitors for 10 years. I'm like, 10 years, right? Um, but I'm wondering, how can you, what advice do you have for us patients tomorrow when we go back to our doctors? How can we have and frame these conversations with them to make sure that we're still in partnership going forward with our treatment plans? Thank you. 
So if I could turn to the lymphedema question first, there are techniques to deal with lymphedema which don't work for everybody, but going to usually a plastic surgeon, not a breast mm -hmm. surgeon, to have one of the several techniques that they have can be helpful. There are very few people in this country, never mind globally, who can do that though. So folks like me need to be not causing lymphedema. And as an example, the Alliance for Clinical Trials at the moment has a, the ARM auxiliary reverse mapping trial up and running, which we're one of the parties to, where when a patient is having her auxiliary surgery, we inject a blue dye into the upper arm so that we can see where the lymphatic channels and which lymph nodes are serving the upper limb and try our darndest to avoid taking those out, taking out the drainage for the upper limb. So that there are preventive things actively happening. We, we could have a much longer conversation of that, but I'm trying to, I'll be very brief and, and, and hand to, to you, Matthew, to address the second point. So how to avoid getting the red devil is kind of what you said. Um, well, it's amazing how much progress we've actually made on that question uh, in terms of this large issue of not giving chemotherapy to patients with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer that don't need it. When the meta-analysis sort of said that chemotherapy works in every single patient with tumors above you know, a centimeter and a half or something, you know, the amount of chemotherapy over treatment was mind-boggling. So, but since we've had uh, molecular prognosticators that can indicate those groups of patients who are just fine with endocrine therapy alone, probably the amount of chemotherapy given to breast cancer patients has been cut in half. So really now the question is, we, we know there are patients who absolutely need chemotherapy. Unfortunately, we'd like to get away from chemotherapy and eventually we might go to these antibodies conjugated chemotherapies, which are a lot more directed. I think we're going in that direction. But right now, lots of patients are getting free chemotherapy. Uh, when I say free, not antibody conjugated, just the old-fashioned way of giving it. And so we're still sort of, you know, perseverating around that issue. And I don't think we had good resolution. Uh, but there has been a move away from anthracycline over the years uh, with, with, for example, TC, uh, taxotere, carboplatin, often given now to patients with no negative disease, uh, avoiding the anthracycline. It seems to be, if anything, slightly better than the old AC regimen. So that, that was an advance. Um, and uh, someone here said, oh my God, the meta-analysis says you're forced to give the A and the taxotere together. No, no, that's not what it says. Uh, it, it's uh, the, the, the way we give these uh, treatments now is using this every two week versus every three week schedule and that achieves what the meta-analysis is talking about and combining A and, A and T. So, so I think you know, we, we've got much better at giving chemotherapy. We've learned how to reduce the amount of it we give. We used to give six cycles of anthracycline. There's definitely patients had cardiac issues with six cycles. Whereas with four cycles and the dose we now give, um, actually cardiac issues are relatively rare. Patients are screened to make sure they don't have problems to begin with. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think we've got better at it, but it, wouldn't it be great to ultimately get rid of anthracycline? I don't think we're too far away from that. I mean, if you have HER2 positive disease, actually it's quite rare to give an anthracycline now. So really mostly it's, uh, it's restricted to very high risk EL positive disease and triple negative disease, although I think we're going to come up with regimens where we can get rid of it in triple negative disease as well fairly soon. So if I could paraphrase the Oxford overview in, in a sentence, I think it said that taxane plus anthracycline was better than taxane followed by anthracycline. But as Matthew's just reinforced, the more modern dose dense regimes that are standard in the United States of four cycles are probably better than what was being done those 20 years ago uh, which was what the Oxford overview yeah, evaluated. Yeah, it was like, yeah, pre-dose dense days. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Uh, question from our online viewers. Uh, does anyone on the panel know if PAM-50 is widely available uh, or is it still limited to the research setting? Can patients request it? <laughs> okay, so I, because I, 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 uh, first of all, I, I have the patent on PAM-50 uh, with Chuck Peru and several other folks. So of course I'm wildly conflicted, but I can tell you as a result uh, where it's available. So, so, so the, the test is called Prosigna, and Prosigna is available with subtyping 
in, in, in 28 countries around the world, except the United States, where the FDA only approved what's called the risk of recurrence score. It looks a bit like the Oncotype score. I'm not going into the comparison between the two, because that would be too much of a conflict of interest. But the FDA didn't allow them to switch on the intrinsic subtype definitions, which is a, actually a, a, a big problem for patients in the United States. So we're, we're designing trials, and I was just talking to Bora and Alastair about this, where basically patients are going to be, say, in neoadjuvant setting. They're going to be treated according to standard of care testing, ERPR-based definitions of breast cancer, versus having the neoadjuvant therapy directed by the intrinsic subtype. Of course, the intrinsic subtype will be measured on the standard of care. It's just that the information will not be provided to the patient and the, and the physician. And so then you'll be able to see the consequences of swapping patients' therapy into the right category on the overall outcome. And hopefully the result is higher rates of complete remission uh, because the patients are not being, getting misdirected therapy. So that's the kind of trial we have to do. I think it's a good trial design. And uh, it won't be executed by me, but by Dr. Lim and by Dr. Thompson. So, but I think that they're the kinds of trials we need to do, comparing the old way of doing things with the new way of doing things and getting patients and, and, and testing the assumption that redirected therapy according to the intrinsic subtype actually improves outcome. What do you think, Paddy? Yeah, it's about time. It's about time, yes. <laughs> How many <laughs> retrospective analyses do we need to look at to know that this is an important thing to know? Yeah. Right. Question from our audience. Molly McDonald with the Pink Fund. I work in the space of cancer-related financial toxicity. Oh, yeah. Um, Dr. Reshma Jags, you just completed a study with our patient population last summer where the patients expressed concern about not understanding the financial implications of their treatment. So, Bora, when you mentioned about patient pet preference between the shot and the ass or <laughs> the oral drug, is it discussed with the patient what their insurance is going to cover, what the cost of the two choices would be so that they can make an intelligent decision? We find that so many patients make decisions around the potential for lost income and the inability to pay their basic cost of living bills. Yeah, I mean, so that's a fantastic questions for multiple different reasons that even for the oral agents that, you know, I know that, for example, Europe has a nice um, the representations of the judging medication, also including the financial implications that, you know, they even have a calculation for you to save a one life by using $1.6 million of this new drug that you're bringing into the market, how you're going to benefit and as a community, are you going to approve this drug or not, whether outside of the efficacy period. So even some of the agents that are used commonly in the U.S. is not approved in the U.K. or some of the European countries, for example. So I think that is one of those areas that we are really not doing a good job. I have to say I made a recent transition of the institution. So in my previous institution, honestly, for the patients to even touch my hand or see me, they already had to go through this multiple steps of consultation with the financial counselor. And one thing I've learned is that I even had a lady that who came from other country, literally for her to sit down with me, she had to pay like $28,000 out of pocket mm -hmm. just to guarantee that she can make it. And I was like, are you nuts? Like, like, I am not that special. You just go back to your home country. I'll talk to your doctor. Mm -hmm. To the point that now I am dealing with a slightly different institution where I cover not only the private side, but also in the uh, Harris Health, you know, the, the county hospital, where some patients have no insurance whatsoever. So I've learned so much about how this insurance covers and even if your insurance actually cover and supposed to have a low deductibles, that doesn't really mean that you're gonna have a full coverage of whatever you know, drugs that you're gonna receive. So I'm trying to be more mindful about that like these days. So there's a certainly a different fee for if the patient has to come for the infusion center and get the injection versus literally you just give out the oral cert. But if your oral cert is also very brand new on the patent clock time, that medication overall could cost you fortunes to get that Mm -hmm. um, just to, you know, the copay covered. So a lot of pharmaceutical companies are also trying to help the patients with the programs, but you have to go through like massive amount of paperwork to even get that, you know, funding approved. So I, I really feel you. I think I am to the point that I think we have to have a almost um, the patient consult. So the thing is, you know, the other question is how much you're going to put your patients through. You already are overwhelmed with your diagnosis. You want to know what you're going to have to do today to save your life. 
And yet you wanted to talk about money, like, you know, are you kidding me? So I think it's very complex. So for that aspect, I'm honestly turned to the patient and say, hey, what do you think that we should do? And I think there has to be more group approach. I think the demand has to come from the patient. Like we are doing our cool science and research. We are very skewed by that. We are not the one who's going to come and demand and say, hey, guys, have you thought about this aspect? How are we going to make a better job as a community to make this this problem go away? So I think it's a way bigger problem, but very serious problem. Yeah. I'll, I'll just follow up and tell you that anecdotally, patients will tell us if they bring up that conversation, they're afraid they're not going to get the best care. Yeah, that's, that's reflected the, the world over, I'm afraid. For radiotherapy, for example, as, as I hope you will all enjoy the debate between Julia White and Charlotte Coles, the current standard of radiation treatment in the UK is five fractions, not the 15 or 16 it used to be or the 25 it was before that. And even in the UK, a socialized healthcare system, there is a resistance to that from the hospitals that lose money by it being five fractions. So Charlotte, as the leader of those trials, is, is fighting and is winning that battle. But in, in this country, we should be moving, and I know people are moving, to five fractions of radiotherapy, not the 15, 16, or 25 that's been historically the big earner and the big cost to patients for, for breast radiotherapy. Yeah, maybe just the last comment on that, because it's helpful when you're looking at all these clinical trials. Uh, so one of my favorite um, metrics when I'm looking at a cl clinical trial is number needed to treat. Okay, so let's take, let's take you know, from a direct example from today's or yesterday's presentations on pimbrolizumab. Let's say the diff to make the math easy, the difference between the getting it and not getting the drug is a 10% difference. Right. So I don't know, at, at three years, 70% of patients are alive um, in the Pembro arm versus 60% at three years in the control arm that didn't get Pembro. 10% difference. Well, to get that 10%, of course, you've got to give everybody pembrolizumab. So the number needed to treat there, 10%, is 10. You've got to treat 10 patients with pembrolizumab to benefit, to prevent one relapse. So with pembrolizumab, for the sake of argument, is $100,000 a year. That means it costs a million dollars <laughs> to prevent one relapse, which is why when you're looking at these curves for these very expensive drugs, for goodness sake, it has to be at least 10% difference to make it worthwhile. Because what you're also not computing in that $100,000 is the cost of side effects that the patient has. You know, uh, so, so I think this healthcare economics issue is looked at very, very carefully in Europe, for example, uh, where they have a different way of funding healthcare. And that's why we get, sometimes get approvals here when the healthcare economics doesn't work for the British NHS because, you know, you can't afford, I mean, basically a human life is, is not worth a million dollars to the healthcare system there, which of course is another ethical issue. But, you know, it's a complicated thing, healthcare uh, economics. And, uh, it's, 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 it's something that's going to be um, debated more and more as more expensive drugs come into, into the hands of Dr. Lim. <laughs> Great. Question from the audience. Um, hi, my name is uh, Graciela Santian. I'm a patient advocate from Los Angeles. Um, so um, I was diagnosed uh, five years ago when I was 37. And um, basically, when I went to go see my initial, you know, my first opinion and all the sub subsequent opinions that I got, they all would basically look and say, oh, you're 37. You need to do the most aggressive treatment. So it seemed like they were basically just looking at my age. And um, although I got a mammoprint and an oncotype and they both, both of these reports said that I was low risk, mm -hmm. they still all said, you should get the most aggressive treatment because you're high risk. Um, so, and you know, based on, you know, although I appreciate the fact that, you know, we have all this data and we're now starting to look into the details and, um, I still feel like after this morning um, that we're basically still saying like if you're premenopausal, you know, you should still get aggressive treatments. <laughs> and you know, everybody in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s possibly 
should get this aggressive treatment because it's very small minorities is going to benefit. And so I guess my question is, um, how do we get better clinical strategies specifically for premenopausal women? Very good question. Perfect. The reason why we struggle in premenopausal women is that premenopausal women are bathed in estrogen. And so uh, if the tumor is estrogen receptor driven, we've got to bring the estrogen level down further from a higher level in a premenopausal woman than in a postmenopausal woman. Postmenopausal women still make estrogen, but they make it from a weird process called aromatization, where they convert adrenal steroids into estrogen in the peripheral tissues. That's what that's that's the is sort of you know low-level estrogen production in postmenopausal women. But premenopausal women, those ovaries are just pumping out estrogen. So, unfortunately, in for example the R Exponder trial they didn't give optimal endocrine therapy. They just gave tamoxifen, basically, for many of those patients. And what happens is that when you give chemotherapy, it poisons the ovaries and puts, many, puts women into, into, to, into menopause. And you can't deconvolute that effect from the chemotherapy effect. So low-risk patients benefit because you poison their ovaries, and high-risk patients benefit because the, because, the, the, because the tumor responded to the chemotherapy and there's sort of, you know, range in between. So now they're talking about redoing all those trials, giving optimal anti-estrogen therapy with ovarian suppression in young women with an RS score of 25 or less. I mean, it's going to be another 10 years to get that result. Isn't that crazy? So, so I think um, the answer to your question is actually better endocrine therapy for, for younger women with the R-positive HER2 negative disease. And uh, knowing the intrinsic subtype, you know, luminal A tumors are just not chemotherapy sensitive. So I think we need to come up with cleverer ways to more rapid progress to de-escalate chemotherapy in young women. Because clearly, I mean, the R responder for the trial for me was, a, was, an un, uh, was an unfortunate failure. Although you would say that the, the magnitude of the benefit in these young, these young women is not that great. It's like two or three or four percent. So you'd start doing that number needed to treat calculation, and you think about the toxicity of chemotherapy. I think some, uh, some patients who are premenopausal can go the route of saying, you know what, I'm just going to do the ovarian suppression and uh, take, take an aromatase inhibitor and tough the side effects out, uh, and I'm not going to take chemotherapy, and I'm going to take a 2 3 4% risk that my outcome could be worse. But I think if I'm luminal A or low recurrence score, I'm going to I'm going to take that risk because it's important to me to avoid the chemotherapy. Um, it will have maybe permanent infertility effects because that's the other thing with young women is fertility preservation, and that's a whole other issue. Probably, when I was in practice, I spent more time with premenopausal women with hormone receptor positive disease than any other subset. Definitely the most difficult consultations possible. And I'm so sorry that you had to go through that journey yourself, uh, but I can tell you alone and I tell you it's still a vexed problem yeah but then also the other observation that I have which is this is very important and hot discussion for field but like if you have a same stage same you know formation and same lymph node involvement we're not if you actually see 30 something year old patients and 70 something year old their tumor behave very differently so we know that anecdotally we cannot pinpoint exactly where they come from, even if it's not hormone dependent tumors, you know, so even for like same TMBC. So there's a certainly a young body producing all the growth hormones and the benefit of having youth also benefits the cancer. So there is a natural fear from the treating physicians that what if I miss something and omit something and my young patients 10 years later, still in their 40s, come up with recurrent cancer with the stage four, that would be devastating. So when you have this young patient, of course, we would like to give everything. So for example, in the BRCA mutated patient, we had a clinical trial that now is presented that if you have a very effective drug that know what's your problem with your specific cancer. I had a young lady who was 30 years old, just about to get married. And because she had a BRCA mutation, we put her on a trial. She had a beautiful response. She cleared her tumor. Then the question came, because she's 30 years old, she has a 70 years to go, are we going to give the aspirin chemotherapy? So we spent so much time, we had a tumor board, we discussed with the 30 oncologists, everybody had a different opinion, 
And the patient, so we had a long discussion. In the end, she said, it's my body. We know this targeted therapy was effective for my cancer, so I'm not going to get the chemotherapy, which I respected. So I think a lot of times the problem is we know you're at high risk. We don't have a good way to treat it. All we got is the chemo. That's why we're giving you chemo. So I think we need to improve that portion. So if we have a really good drug to give it to you without having to give you that much toxicity and we know it's going to be effective, then we are going to save you from a lot of those toxicities. So I think it's our fault that we are sitting here in our, you know, butt and talk. We should do more research and make sure we develop new drug. So I think actually that's what we need to do. That's just my personal. Yeah, what, just one last comment. Um, one thing that I think is missing from the clinical trial results is just analyzing also what the age is of the people that are benefiting, because I wonder if that small, you know, 2% is 59 and a half years old, like, you know, about to go into menopause, and that's why, you know, they benefited, or whether they're like 20 years old, and that's why they benefited, and that's just yeah. a piece of the puzzle that I don't know. Actually, in ER positive disease, being young is a bad prognostic factor. There's no question about it. So that's why, you know, everyone's really concerned about hormone receptor positive disease in young women. That was, that's been seen in most series. And we did a lot of molecular analysis of tumors almost by decade. So we did a bit of big gene panel and, you know, by decade. And you can actually see the molecular structures of the tumor are different in younger women than older women, different patterns of recurrently mutated genes. So it really is a different, it can be a different disease in younger women. And obviously also the hereditary breast cancer component, uh, you know, that, that keeps evolving and we keep finding new genes that are predisposing younger women. Something's going on with younger women who've been diagnosed that's probably in part genetic for sure, not, not, not so exposure related. So, you know, uh, more research and more research as you say, targeting this whole young uh, women uh, question, because still younger women are often diagnosed and there's no evidence of BRCA1, no evidence of BRCA2, no PALB2. Sequencing panel is completely negative, but there they are sitting in front of you, age 28 with breast cancer. What's that, right? So I think the youngest patient I ever treated was like 19 and she had a completely negative panel. Thank you. I had a question from our online viewers. Um, the, the panelists, can we th touch on the Emerald study? Um, the question is, did the study seem to suggest that uh, oral delivery might be an option for patients who would have otherwise expected PICRA concurrently with fulvestrant? So the Emerald <laughs> study was this, uh, the oral study, um, yeah. um, which I did here, Bardia, so beautifully presented. So what's to say, did the Emerald trial suggest the oral CERD might be an option for folk who might have expected PICRA concurrently with fulvestrant, or the trial most focused on oral CERD as a single agent? Okay, so um, this is a next generation question. The most important thing about this trial with this oral CERD is it is, it is proof of principle that an, uh, a potent endocrine drug can be effective after giving CDK4-6 inhibitor for metastatic breast cancer, which if you were a molecular biologist, you would have a serious concern about because the way the CDK4-6 inhibitors work, you would assume that if they were resistant to them, they'd also be resistant to endocrine therapy, wouldn't you? I mean, you would if you thought about it, but in fact, that's not the case which says that in some patients, estrogen receptor is such a strong driver that it's still a target after the CDK4-6 inhibitor. And I thought that was a really important thing because what it says is, you know, um, this is a population where we can maybe, with combinations, really make a difference, um, where you give an oral CERD plus maybe, you know, this, this fancy PI3 kinase inhibitor, which I've actually seen quite... Uh, quite a lot of activity and a lot of toxicity as well, but it is, it is a drug that uh, it, helps some patients. So we've opened up a new Pandora's box where the oral CERD is the backbone and we're now adding things, hopefully, you know, in a targeted way, not just with PI3 kinase inhibitors, but maybe with HER2 uh, inhibitors, maybe your, your NF1 trial in the future, uh, we, could do, we could do better than full vestrant in that combination trial. So lot, lots of going on in this field. So, but this was a, the door was opened today to all those possibilities. And so that's why I thought it was an important result.
The, the, the other point being raised is that that was a trial in postmenopausal women. Mm -hmm. and, and if the work is done in postmenopausal women, that's generally where the FDA, if it's going to give approval, will give the approval? Yeah, well, by the time you're in getting second line endocrine therapy for ER positive breast cancer, everybody's postmenopausal. That's the nature of the beast. Yeah. Uh, it's the nature of the beast because in metastatic disease, that's the first thing you do is start an LHRH agonist and shut the ovaries down. And many of those patients go on to have orthorectomies, or they've had doses of chemotherapy that put their ovaries to sleep. So, but you know, when we're getting into the early stage disease, you're absolutely right. That's going to have to be considered. Yeah. So just to kind of clarify that we still have to have a confirmatory trials. We know it's going to work, but we still have to have a trial to show to FDA to say yes, that you know, we, we can combine that with the oral, oral agent. So I think that is a still current mechanism to how we get the drug approval. So unfortunately, that still painful step needs to be happening before we can use that in the clinic. Yeah. Okay. One last question from the audience. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. My, my name's Nicole Liadis, and I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Lim today. I work for an AI a platform cancer research company, but my question is from the perspective of a cancer advocate helping cancer patients or family and friends navigate cancer. So I'm wondering, in line with talking about the future of cancer care, how can the cancer, cancer care community help facilitate patients to have better access, not just to clinical trials, but the, the right clinical trial for their type of cancer? A lot of the times, um, cancer patients uh, are told, you know, this is the clinical trial that's offered at our institution. But you know that the clinicians go to meetings like that and know that someone on the other side of the country might have a better clinical trial for that patient. Mm. So what do you think? How do you see the future of, you know, providing access to clinical trials that are catered for that particular patient and collaboration through with clinic clinicians? Could, could I begin to answer your question? I think advocates are probably the key uh, at two levels. One is in the design and the implementation of each clinical trial to make sure that we're not doing crazy things as clinicians. And there's a very fine example, the COMET trial, active monitoring versus surgery. The patient liaison team have just been brilliant at driving that to, to be a sensible trial. And then the other place is actually in the clinic. Um, where a patient is going to go and see whichever clinicians and, and decisions be made. And if, if we could get more advocacy for the patient in the sharp point of entry into, into whichever hospital system they're going into, I think that would be hugely valuable for all parties. And that yeah. starts at the institution where they're at, right? Not necessarily. I mean, I think uh, I would advise, I, I would recommend to talk to Janice, Patty, and Bob, they have tried to do this with us for years, and they give us all this list of potential. And then, you know, there's app, there's advocacy training that we're trying to go through. And so even the patients can be very proactively screen their own cancer and trying to find the clinical trial options. I think to me, it's more of a logistical issue. Even if you find the best trial for you, you are still responsible to travel across the street and trying to participate. So how you can try to eliminate those. I think we may have to rely on something like an ASCO, San Antonio Breast Cancer Conference, that even if you're living in a different state, how can you actually have a true access of the clinical trial? You know, I mean, why Like, why not they have the, what's the drone, deliver your medication combination to your house and say, sign this and then bring it back and, you know, we right. consent, why not? <laughs> well, I was thinking about this. So imagine yeah. you've got, you know, some, let, not a drug that's wildly toxic and requires IV stuff, but let's say some oral drugs. We didn't talk about these new certs, for example. Why can't we have a trial where basically the patient, uh, you know, there's some kind of connector, you know, of that patient who's a seeker like you're describing. Let's say the patient lives in rural Arkansas or something, but they definitely want to go in the clinical trial if they possibly can. That patient is adopted by an advocate person who, who, who's sort of trained, right? 
And obviously the, 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 the drug is shipped to that individual. There's regular Zoom meetings. The, the, the physicians are involved. They can go to their local doctor for a physical exam. They don't have to go to you know, a fancy comprehensive cancer center. Um, the local scans are enough. And with medical records, all that information can be sucked up and the images can be, can be obtained with your clever AI sort of type company. And a lot of trials can be done remotely you know, uh, toxicity monitoring, you know, uh, et cetera. So I, I don't think, I think we need to think hard about it. I think, I think you're right. Uh, and, and imagine how, I mean, do you know that basically only 5% of women with breast cancer go on a clinical trial? 5%. No wonder progress is slow. So, so let's, let's think about how we, that number can be more like 30 or 40%. <laughs> and that, we, we would, everything would move so much faster. Well, on that note, unfortunately, we're out of time for the evening. Uh, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Lim, Dr. Ellis, thank you so much for your time tonight. Round of applause. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Fantastic.